Hi, Becca. Do you want to um, see if you can share your screen? Are we good? Oh, wait, why is it paused? So Ben, you about gave me a heart attack. How? It looks good to me. Okay. Also, um, I just want to make sure it's okay that we are recording this. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Ben, did you pause the sharing or did I just do that? Hi, Angela. Um, yeah, I did not do anything. Okay, that was my bad. Well, welcome everybody to our nutrition exercise physiology seminar for today. I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's right at four and, and Becca and her committee have important business to do after this. And so I don't want to delay that at all. Um, thank you for coming everyone. We're really happy um, that, you, that you made it. And um, I'm just delighted to get to introduce Becca Dirks to you all. Um, Becca came to us from Montana in 2015, and she came with um, two undergraduate degrees from Montana State, a degree in exercise science and a bachelor's in food and nutrition and dietetics. And she came as a master's student and really just hit the ground running. She, um, that very next semester, presented an abstract at EB and, and, and never, never slowed down. Um, she quickly decided, uh, 
after a couple of semesters that she wanted to transition from the master's program to the PhD program. And I am so delighted that she made that choice. I know there were probably moments where she was questioning that decision, but she's here at the end and we're all very, very proud of her. Um, Becca has um, six um, publications already and three of those are first author and she has uh, two more in the works and one of those is um, under revision. So she's accomplished a lot in the five years that she's been here. She's had the chance to present her work at Experimental Biology at the American Society for Nutrition, at the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research, and at ACSM. So because her her work in bone crosses all these disciplines, she gets to go to um, a variety of meetings. Um, so not only do I want to recognize Becca's um, research accomplishments, but she has made just incredible contributions um, to the department in her um, TAing. She has TAed um, several of our undergraduate classes, online, writing intensive, large classes. She has um, really gotten a lot of experience with undergraduate teaching, and, and that's something that she wants to do. So I'm glad that she's, she's uh, gotten to have that experience. So I think, um, well, I guess there's one other thing I want to say. I really just have so much respect for all of our graduate students who are finishing their um, degrees during this pandemic. It is so stressful as it is to complete um, a degree, as, as those of us who've done that know, and to do it under these circumstances, I, I really can't imagine. So um, you really demonstrated extra perseverance and um, resilience. And so kudos to you to, for that, um, Becca, and to the rest of our, our students as well. So um, Becca today, um, she's not gonna present all of the work that she's done. She's really decided that she just wanna focus on her dissertation project. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Becca and ask that you all be sure and um, mute your microphones. Um, yesterday I was giving a lunchtime webinar and somebody started talking about 15 bean soup, which was really disrupting to me. So please um, be sure and mute your microphones. All right, thank you, Becca, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Rizina. Um, So like she said, today we're gonna pretty much talk about my um, main dissertation project. I guess I can skip. Um, but so we're gonna be primarily talking about hormonal, oopsies, um, control of bone health. So for the majority of my career here at MU, um, I have focused on skeletal outcomes, um, skeletal health primarily focusing on estrogen, and we've primarily focused on estrogen um, in male bone. And so we're going to talk about estrogen in bone. We're going to talk about a, briefly talk about a couple of the studies um, that I've done related to um, the role of estrogen receptor alpha, and then we're going to get into my main dissertation project, which has to do with gestational exposure to bisphenols. So just kind of some basics, so we're all on the same page to start. Um, we're going to primarily be talking about long bones today, which are things like your um, femur and your humerus and your tibia. And bone is split into two kind of what we call compartments, and there's two main types of bone. So there's um, cancellous bone, which you may have also heard of as trabecular bone or spongy bone, and that is this bone that's kind of in the end. I'm going to use my mouse, so hopefully you guys can see that. Um, this spongy bone that's in the end, and then the other part um, is cortical bone, or you may have heard it called compact bone, which is this harder bone that makes up the shaft and kind of the shell around the trabecular bone. And so different um, signals and growth factors will hit those compartments differently, and so it's kind of important when you're talking about bone to make sure that you're separating those out. So bone mass increases and then decreases with age. Everybody goes through the same form of um, increasing age through growth and then around the age of 30 um, you hit your peak bone mass and then it, you start to lose it with age. But as you can see here whether or not you really achieve your full peak bone mass um, can be related to several lifestyle factors such as your diet and your exercise. And another one of those factors is actually your hormonal status. And so there's been a lot of research um, showing how important estrogen is 
to bone growth as well as the maintenance of bone as you age. And so that's well known in women um, because you tend to go through menopause and then lose bone. Um, but there's recently been a big push in realizing how important estrogen is for men as well. Um, so estrogen plays a significant role in bone health throughout the entire lifespan. Um, over here on the left, this is a diagram showing the importance of estrogen during puberty. Um, so kind of down here on the left, you have males. On the right, you have females. Um, so yes, androgens and testosterones do play a role, but what plays an even bigger role is estrogen, and particularly estrogen's effects on growth hormone. And so you can see that estrogen plays a big role um, in growth and maintenance of both cortical and trabecular bone um, in both males and females, but it kind of does it in a different way. Um, so you can see these black bands here in males, um, it tends to lead to periosteal expansion, which is growth on the outside of the bone. Um, whereas in females, it tends to lead to endosteal expansion or growth on the inside surface of the bone. Um, estrogen also plays a significant role in protecting your bone as you age. Um, so over here, this is a study done in aged males um, relating uh, bioactive um, sex hormones to your risk of fracture in age. Um, so you can see down here estrogen levels, um, or the bottom is estrogen levels, the top is testosterone, and then your sex hormone binding globulin. So low estrogen increases males' risk for fracture regardless of their testosterone status. Uh, but if they have low testosterone and estrogen, um, then that is even worse. Um, also, if you have high sex hormone binding globulin, which would make that estrogen not very available to your tissues, that also can significantly increase your risk of fracture. Um, so how does it do this? So we're just going to kind of kind of cover classical estrogen signaling, um, but estrogen can bind across the cell membrane and it can bind, bind to ER alpha and ER beta, which are the two main estrogen receptors. They're nuclear receptors. Um, after estrogen binds, they bind to the estrogen response element on the DNA and they affect gene transcription, which leads to a lot of downstream effects on bone and other tissues. Um, in bone, we have this differential distribution of the receptors. So we tend to find ER alpha in cortical bone, um, kind of in that middle bone. And then you tend to see ER beta more in the trabecular bone or the bone on the ends. Um, and it should be noted that estrogen or estradiol is not the only thing that can bind to these estrogen receptors. Um, there are also things like phytoestrogens that we find in soy proteins, or there's also selective estrogen receptor modulators, um, as well as a lot of other things that can also do this binding to bone. Um, and we're going to kind of focus on those selective estrogen receptor modulators um, because some of those could be treatments. Um, so things like breast cancer treatments are often things like uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Um, and then there's also certain environmental molecules that we come into contact with on a daily basis that can also bind to these estrogen receptors. So when it comes to bone, again, we're kind of mainly going to be focusing on some of these things like bone mass and bone structure and bone shape, and especially in adults, all of that is under the control of this process called bone remodeling. And so osteoclasts come in, um, they break down bone, they resorb the bone, whether that's because the bone is damaged or maybe just because the body needs calcium. Um, and then at, in response to that, osteoblasts come back into that hole and they um, grow, regrow bone and they kind of fill it in. Um, so I said estrogen is um, an important hormone when it comes to bone, and that's because estrogen is what we would consider a very pro-bone hormone. Um, so a lot of those downstream effects of estrogen binding lead to things like increased differentiation of your osteoblasts, um, increased proliferation. It helps them get to the bone surface so that they can build bone. Um, it also does things like um, stopping osteoclast differentiation, um, leading to osteoclast apoptosis, so they kind of stop that resorbing activity. Um, but there is one more question because there's a lot of how estrogen works that we do already know. Um, but there is this one other protein that we need to talk about called sclerostin, and sclerostin is a bone growth inhibitor. So every 
off or every on switch needs an off switch. Um, and so sclerostin is one of those ones that comes in and kind of says, hey, you know what? We have enough bone here. We don't really need to grow. Um, so one of the questions kind of in the bone community is whether or not estrogen has a um, regulatory effect on sclerostin expression. Um, and in humans, there does seem to be some uh, in, evidence that estrogen can regulate sclerostin expression. Um, so this was a study done in older men and women. Um, on the left, you have postmenopausal women. This was control women compared to women who had just started estrogen treatment. Um, and you can see a significant uh, decrease in sclerostin expression. Also, this study was also uh, meant to validate like a new assay. So that's why there's two bars. So there's not, there's not actually any difference between these two bars as far as study design. They were just um, doing a new assay. Um, and then on the right in older men, um, this had, was a study looking more at estrogen treatment and then estrogen withdrawal. Um, and you can see that these uh, individuals who lost estrogen saw an increase um, in sclerostin expression. But it should be noted that this was based on circulating sclerostin levels and sclerostin is a very localized hormone. And so there is this question of whether or not what's happening in the blood is also happening um, directly in the bone. Um, so we wanted to explore all of this kind of further. And so like I said, my first couple studies we're just going to really briefly talk about. One of these is already published. One of these is currently under review, but we had two um, global ER alpha knockout models, um, male mice, um, and one was younger and one was older. And we found that regardless of age, ER alpha knockout leads to impairments in cortical geometry, but improvements in trabecular microarchitecture. Um, so they had thinner, smaller bones as far as the cortical bone goes, but they actually had a more robust trabecular bone. Um, and that was true in the femur, the tibia, and the vertebrae. So that was true. Um, that was a pretty consistent finding through all of those studies. Um, we also found that exercise can reverse these impairments in cortical geometry. So when the animals were allowed to exercise, um, it restored that phenotype and they matched the wild type animals again. Um, and that was a really important finding because um, especially as individuals age, um, we needed exercise is one of those most important um, lifestyle factors you can make. Um, and there is a question of where estrogen belongs in that. And so it was really cool to see that even if we took out ER alpha, these animals could still respond to exercise. Um, we also found that global ER alpha knockout animals increased sclerostin expression in an age dependent manner. So we saw increases in the older animals, but not the younger ones. But that was kind of what I did how, when I started. Um, and so now we kind of want to get into our main um, dissertation topic, which is how does gestational exposure to bisphenols A and S impact the skeleton of adult offspring? Um, so what are bisphenols? Bisphenols are selective estrogen receptor modulators found in plastics, receipt paper, and certain medical and dental supplies. Um, in humans, the most common exposure route is food contamination. Um, that could possibly be because of um, leaching. So a few things like plastic water bottles and plastic Tupperwares, um, some of that BPA can get into um, the food. So you might have seen water bottles with stickers and stuff that say, oh, they're BPA free. Um, but also BPA is often used in the epoxies that line cans for canned food, um, which I mean, it's a good thing that we line canned food because nobody wants metal poisoning either. Um, but that is the most common exposure route for humans in BPA. Um, and yes, BPA are um, selective estrogen receptor modulators, but they also can alter epigenetic programming. And so it's, there's been um, a decent amount of evidence showing that younger exposure leads to a, a more negative or a more robust negative response. Um, and so there are certain countries, particularly in the EU and Canada, um, that have already banned BPA from things like bottles and sippy cups and things that are designed for babies and young children. Um, also, it should be noted that in most studies looking at urinary or serum concentrations of BPA, um, it's almost ubiquitous. Um, they can find it in anywhere from 90 to 99 percent of the samples. So this isn't something that just um, the person who has a plastic water bottle needs to worry about. Like this is something that many of us are exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so like I said, they are selective estrogen receptor modulators. Um, this is because of these similar structural 
um, structural similarities between B the bisphenol molecules and estradiol. Um, BPA was kind of the main, the first bisphenol. Um, so the majority of the studies have looked at BPA, but there's several other analogs um, such as BPS and BPF. Um, and so you can see that yes, they can um, bind to the estrogen receptor, but it should be noted that they are considered weak estrogens. Um, so you can see here with the binding curve, um, these black circles are estrogen, um, the open squares are BPA, and the open circles here are BPS, which is the other one that our study focused on. Um, so you can see that yes, they can mimic, at least BPA can mimic the binding curve of ER alpha, but um, or estrogen, but it's at a much higher concentration. Um, and also there is this pretty distinct difference between the binding abilities of BPA and BPS. Um, so we know that estrogen is good for bone and we know that bisphenols, particularly BPA, can have some anti-estrogenic effects. So what do we know about bisphenols and bone? And the answer is very little. <laughs> um, so this was a study done on school-aged children. Um, so just to kind of orient you, the bottom half of the graph is the girls, the top half of the graph is boys, um, and the lowest percentile of BPA exposure was the reference value, or kind of one, and then all of these numbers are difference in height z-score um, in these children. And you can see that um, particularly in the boys, um, at this 90th percentile of urinary BPA, they had a significant decrease in height z-score. Um, and this remained true when this was corrected for things like pubertal status, maternal and parental heart, um, height, activity levels, and other things that could affect height. And this also remained true at follow-up a year later. So there does seem to be some indication, at least in boys, um, that BPA could have some kind of interruption on um, skeletal health. But like I said, they also has epigenetic um, factors or, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Effects, there we go. Um, so it can also have epigenetic alterations and effects. Um, and so times of the frequent growth or high growth are when we're most vulnerable. Um, and so uh, people have also started looking into the gestational effects. Um, this is a, these are a couple studies done in rats. Um, and it seems that BPA and BPS can have sex and dose dependent effects when it's administered um, in a gestational model. Um, so down at the bottom, this was a study looking at um, I think it was rats, and it was the females and the males total cross-sectional area. Um, so on the left you have females and you can see that there's no differences, but in the males um, they do have a significant difference, but it only seems to be at some of those lower doses, um, whereas this study is looking at cortical thickness, and this was only the males because again there wasn't really many differences in the females. Um, and again, there's kind of these dose-dependent responses. Sometimes cortical thickness could increase, sometimes it would decrease. Um, and we generally kind of think that this is happening because BPA is blocking all of those pro-bone actions that estrogen normally has on bone cells. Um, so we kind of wanted to further explore this possible interruption um, and explore how gestational exposure would impact the skeleton. Um, and we also wanted to introduce another one of those analogs because, again, most of the studies so far have been on BPA and we know even less about some of those other analogs. Um, so study design, this slide right here is what we did to the dams or the moms um, in the study. And so we split them into three exposure groups. So we have BPA exposure, we have BPS exposure, and then we have the controls. We gave them 200 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. Um, and then within each of those groups, we split them into sedentary animals and exercising animals. Um, and this was because this was actually this, my study with the bones was actually part of a larger study where somebody else was looking at some of those metabolic effects possibly um, of BPA exposure and they wanted to see if exercise could kind of counteract some of those effects. Um, and so with this resulted in a three by two design resulting in six overall treatment groups. Um, and it should be noted that the animals that we are calling sedentary um, there was a wheel in their cage, it was just locked. Um, so they had something to play with, they had something to kind of climb on, they had normal um, cage activity, they were not forced to be fully sedentary, but they could not run on the wheel like the other animals could. 
So we took each dam, um, we started treatment. Two weeks later, we mated the animals. Um, so, and then after birth, we kept one male and one female offspring. Um, and then through just, we kept them, they would have kept, kept being exposed through both gestation and lactation. Um, and then at weaning, we took them and we separated them out into their own cages. And so at weaning, exposure should have stopped. Um, they should not have been exposed to BPA after that, and they were not given any kind of um, exercise wheel or exercise treatment. Um, so just kind of a blanket statement um, so that we're all on the same page. Um, so if I say something like, hey, exercise had an effect, then that would be maternal exercise or exercise that happened while they were um, gestating and lactating. Not then, but okay. Um, and also you might notice that uh, the animals were at different ages. Um, so we originally were um, planning for everybody to be sacrificed around 16 weeks, but we started having some issues with um, aggression and bullying in the male animals. Um, and so we sacrificed them a little bit earlier because we didn't want that to interact some of the effects. And then that took enough time that the female and females ended up being a little bit older. Um, so because of that, we did not do any direct sex comparisons and we kind of treated the males and females like they were two different studies. Um, at Sacrifice, they underwent an EMPICO MRI to do body composition and then we collected the femur and the tibia. And so we're going to be talking about um, cortical geometry and trabecular microarchitecture. So again, some of those structural um, components of the bone. We're going to be talking about biomechanical properties of the cortical bone. Um, we tested sclerosin expression via immunohistochemistry. And then we also looked at the mineral apposition rate. Um, as far as stats, we did two-way ANOVAs and ANCOVAs based on maternal exercise and BPA or BPS exposure. Um, and we used an ANCOVA for cortical geometry and the biomechanical properties of the cortical bone because body weight is a major predictor of cortical bone. And so we wanted to make sure that we were taking that into account. Um, and then if there was any interactions, we did a post hoc one way ANOVA. Structural properties of the bone, we're going to be talking about cortical bone geometry. Um, the main thing there is kind of size or area of the bone, so how much, um, how much space did that bone take up, um, as well as cortical thickness. So not just how much bone is there, but how thick or thin are the actual cortices. Um, trabecular microarchitecture, we're going to be talking about things like bone volume, trabecular thickness, trabecular separation, um, connectivity density. So on the left here, we have a picture of um, really good, really robust trabecular bone. Um, there's a lot of interconnectedness. There's a lot of bone itself. Um, on the right, you have this really poor trabecular bone where it's got some gaps and it's not very connected. There's a lot less bone in general. Um, biomechanical properties of the bone. We're going to take a really <laughs> quick step back into material science 101. Um, so there's a few different ways to test uh, the biomechanical properties of the bone, but we use three-point bending. Um, and so you have this um, apparatus that you place the bone on. There's two points at the bottom and there's this point at, in the middle on the top. Um, the one in the middle moves and so it pushes down on the bone and the bone bends until it breaks. Um, and so, to do, and then using that data, you can calculate these biomechanical properties of the bone. Um, and so what we're mainly looking at is, A, we're going to look at maximal load, which is just the total load that the bone could withstand before fracture. Um, but we're also going to be looking at measures of stiffness, and we're really going to be looking at measures of toughness. And so stiffness, from a material standpoint, is a measure of how elastic or brittle um, a, a tissue is. And so that's kind of how well it can deform before it breaks. Um, so a pretty good example is thinking of a piece of glass versus like a wooden twig. Um, so if you have a piece of glass, it doesn't really deform before it breaks. If you break it, it just breaks, it just shatters. Um, whereas if you think of a twig, especially like a really young green twig, um, you can bend it, you can twist it. Yes, it will deform, but it won't really break. Or it will break, but it will deform a lot before it does. Um, and so with, 
bone, you kind of want somewhere in the med in the middle. You don't want it to be too brittle or too stiff. Um, brittle bone disease is a thing that you guys may have heard of. Um, and so obviously too brittle is a problem, but too soft or too elastic is also a problem because your bone needs to be able to work as a lever for your muscles. It needs to be able to keep you standing upright and you don't want just bendy bones all over the place either. Um, work to fracture or toughness on the other hand is um, a measure of the bone's ability to absorb energy before it breaks. Um, and we split them into whole bone properties and then tissue level properties, and they're pretty analogous. So stiffness usually um, kind of goes with Young's modulus of elasticity, work to fracture kind of goes with modulus of toughness. Um, but the difference is the whole bone property is like the property of the femur, um, whereas the tissue level property would be like if you took a sheet of the cortical bone material um, and like laid it out and then tested it. So the tissue level properties are calculated from a stress strain curve, which is, means they have been normalized for the size and the shape of the bone. Um, finally, mineral apposition rate, we measured through a process called dynamic histomorphometry. Um, so we give the animals two different um, injections of different colored uh, fluorescent calcium labels. Um, and so we give them one injection, a few days later we give them the second injection, and then a few days later you sacrifice the animal. And they will um, pick up those fluorescent labels and embed them into the calcium as they build bone. And so you get a kind of a cool picture like this where you can see the labeling around the surface. Um, mineralization is not happening at all points of the bone at all times. And so you might get some portions where there's not really color. Um, you might get some portions where there's just red or there's just green. Um, but you're looking for portions like this where the red and the green are next to each other. Um, and then you measure the distance of the points and then you divide it by the time between injections and then you kind of know how quickly um, osteoblasts are laying down mineral. Okay, um, so before we get to results, um, I also just wanted to say that similar to other studies, um, we did not see any differences in the females. So just to kind of save them some time and because it's not very exciting, we're not gonna talk about the females. Um, I'm just going to report the male um, results. Um, so maternal exercise decreases body um, per fat percentage in the male offspring. Um, also, again, another note, we didn't really take a lot of data or collect a lot of data um, between weaning and sacrifice. Um, so all these, these, these things are present at 16 weeks when we sacrifice the animals, um, but I cannot necessarily tell you when they should have. Um, but at 16 weeks, there was this significant decrease in body fat percentage in the male offspring. Um, moving on to bone stuff, we can see that uh, BPA, but not BPS actually, um, exposure decreased the cortical thickness in the male offspring. So there was no differences in total area, um, cortical area, marrow area. So you can see that the bone themselves were similar sized, um, but the BPA animals had much thinner cortices. Um, however, there was no effect of bisphenol A or bisphenol S on the, those biomechanical um, properties of the cortical bone. However, there was um, some significant effects related to maternal exercise. Um, so maternal exercise increased the stiffness of the bone, um, and then there was an interaction between exercise and um, BPA exposure when it came to work to fracture and modulus of toughness. Um, so you can kind of see that Exercise increased the toughness in the BPS and the control animals, but not the BPA animals. However, there was no main effects of maximal force or the maximal load that the bone could withstand before fracture. I'm looking at the trabecular bone. Um, we can also see the BPA, but again, not BPS. Um, in paratrabecular microarchitecture in the male offspring, there was a decrease in bone volume. Um, there was a decrease in trabecular number. There was an increase in trabecular uh, separation and there was an interaction with connectivity density and you can just visually see oops um, based on these micro ct images that the bpa animals just had less bone um, it hit the point where i could open a scan and just look at the bone and be like yeah this is a bad bone um, at the time i wasn't sure if they were all in the same group but then they ended up being all in the same group um, so you see this really negative effect of bpa when it comes to trabecular bone um, interestingly, we did not see any effects of maternal exercise or BPA or BPS exposure on sclerosin expression, which if you're not familiar with immunohistochemistry, um, we're looking at staining. And so these darker brown 
cells are positively stained, these lighter blue cells are negatively stained, and you're kind of looking at a percentage of which ones are positive. Um, and we did not see any differences in sclerostin expression. Um, we also did not see any differences in mineral apposition rate, um, which means the osteoblast activity seemed to be pretty um, standard amongst all of those groups. Um, and so just kind of overall, we found some pretty significant impairments in at least cortical bone and trabecular microarchitecture. And so we think that um, BPA is blocking this estrogen signaling. It's leading to altered epigenetic programming um, in utero. It's leading to interrupted estrogen signaling overall. And that's leading to this impaired cortical geometry and impaired trabecular microarchitecture. Um, so overall conclusions. Um, did I talk really fast? I talked really fast. Okay. Um, overall conclusions, going all the way back to the beginning, um, throughout the past few years, we've found that estrogen signaling through ER alpha plays a significant role in skeletal health in young and aged male mice, particularly in that cortical bone. Um, however, we found that estrogen receptor alpha is not required for an osteogenic response to exercise in male mice, which is a really cool, really pretty new finding. Um, and we also found that gestational and lactational exposure to BPA and maternal exercise can significantly impact skeletal outcomes in the, again, the male but not the female offspring. Um, and obviously, if we were not looking at them until 16 weeks of age, this has long-term effects even into adulthood. Um, this could also have some pretty significant impacts on recommendations during pregnancy if this is found to be translatable to humans. Um, so we're pretty excited about this um, study and are kind of really excited to see where it goes from here. Um, finally, I just want to thank a lot of people. Um, my committee, my advisor, Dr. Brezina, has been awesome. I genuinely do not think I could have come up with a better advisor for me if I had had magic and a wand. Um, the rest of my committee has been super supportive. Um, they've let me use space in their lab. They've helped me with protocols. They've helped me when I had questions. Um, they've listened to me rant and rave when I don't know what I'm doing. Um, Dr. Peterson, I have been a TA for for the past few years. She's been awesome to TA for. Um, Dr. Laura Ortonow, who was here um, in this lab when I started, and she did a great job of getting me started in this bone world and teaching me a lot of some of these protocols. Um, Grace and Rebecca have been helpful when I am ripping my hair out because my protocols aren't working. Um, I want to thank Dr. Cheryl Rosenfeld. She provided the animals for the BPA story, um, and then some of those core um, programs that we have here have been super awesome, especially with some of those pictures that I have. I could not have gotten those cool fluorescent pictures without them, um, as well as just a thank you to the Nutrition and Exercise Physiology Department for being supportive, for giving me a paycheck for the past five years. Um, and then also just all my friends and family that have helped me along the way. Um, I have a really great support system, and it's been really nice to have people to call if I need to vent or need to talk. And I also would like to give a special shout out to my girlfriend for A, being very supportive as I have anxiety cried my way through the last year. Um, and also B, because she promised me there would be pizza and wine at home when all of this is over. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and off with that, I will take any questions. I don't know how to do this. Do I stop sharing my screen now? Yeah, sure. So while I'm waiting to get the first question, I would like to acknowledge that Dr. Laura Ortnow is here in attendance today. So that's extra special to have Laura come back and, <laughs> and see Becca's seminar. So thank you, Laura, for, for being here. Any, any questions for Becca? Certainly somebody has a question. Anybody? Okay, I do. <laughs> yeah, go for it. All right, I, I've asked like so many questions to Becca over the past couple of days. She's probably so sick of me. <laughs> and this might just be more of a semantics question than anything, but you mentioned how you thought that maybe BPA is blocking estrogen. Do you think it's blocking or just over com like competing with those binding sites? Um. <laughs> both um so <laughs> 
So um, it can, it can, I would say more competitive. Um, it's, it's able to bind to the estrogen receptor. So if, if BPA binds, then estrogen cannot. Um, and there has been some cell culture studies showing that it is a competitive binder. Um, but also the reason you classify it as like a selective estrogen receptor modulator is that um, when it binds to the estrogen receptor, it can actually cause um, gene transcription, it just causes gene transcription in a different way um, than like classical estrogen signaling. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's kind of both, like it's both competing as well as changing um, okay. the, the binding in general. Yeah. And then, okay, sorry. <laughs> I just thought this one, and this one also might be a bad one, but I think you're used to it by now. Um, can, what are they called? the um, sex hormone binding globulins, do those bind to BPA? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I focus more on the receptor. I'm not 100% sure about if it binds to the binding, or, um, the binding globulin. That's a good question, though. Thanks. Can I, can I ask about... Um, mechanisms a, a little more about for you to speculate about because when I think of exercise I think of energy balance and I think of you know turnover and metabolism and but you also mentioned epigenetics and everything what if you were going to do the next experiment what would that be um oh that's a big question Dr. Parks yeah sorry um, Oh, no, that's fine. Um, so I think there's kind of a, a couple of different things. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do um, one. So this one, we were not really expecting, sorry, I'm going to start over. We were not really expecting to see any um, differences based on maternal exercise because we were like, what? Um, so I, I didn't necessarily have as much time to really think about those ones. But for me, at least, I think that the next question would be, um, to look at BPA exposure because these were gestational and lactational. Um, so I think it would be really cool to look at just gestational and that might help you narrow down um, if it was some of that like more epigenetic uterine programming versus it was just like, oh, well, during lactation and at early youth, you may have had interrupted estrogen signaling. Um, the maternal exercise, there's definitely a question that, you know, there was a decrease in body fat percentage as well. Um, so is it something with uh, something with energetics? Is it something related to fat content? Um, so you could do something like, I mean, maybe some kind of caloric control or something, but I think it also would be really interesting to get a little bit more mechanistic in the bone itself and see what changes were going on. Um, because we just mainly looked at some of the 3D structure changes, so like shape and size, but you can really get into that um, like nanostructures of the bone, like, hey, how did its collagen um, interact? Yeah. And all, all a lot of that um, impacts things like toughness. So I think that would be really cool to look at as well. Um, what, um, and B, is BPA concentrated in, in milk? Or is it, is it there just passing freely? And ends um, up I believe it's just passing freely. And I forgot to mention this, but it does cross the placental barrier. So we do but know that for sure. Um, yeah. As far as um, breast milk, I believe it's just kind of a passive. It's just kind of there. I don't believe it's concentrated. Thank you. I have a question, Becca. Yeah. Um, and that is about estrogen receptor beta. So, um, so yeah, so something that Cheryl and I have been really kind of talking about throughout this process is what this mutation might actually do to that other receptor. And I know we probably know more about ER alpha in bone, but can you speak to anything about ER beta? And before you get there, I just want to give one tiny little bit of perspective on the study, just because I, you may not know this, but kind of the reason why we, at the out front, did this maternal exercise was based on the fact that there are previous studies that have shown that maternal BPA consumption has a negative metabolic effect on, um, on the offspring. And we know that to be true in both males and females. So we did the study with sort of that in mind, like what does, can exercise mitigate those negative effects? But what was really kind of bizarre, and I guess pr probably why we haven't really published the, the rest of the study is that we didn't see those effects. So I think it's really quite interesting because we didn't see 
that maternal BPA adversely affected metabolism, yet you're finding these really interesting effects on bone, which to me suggests that there's something different going on on bone than on metabolism. So I think that in and of itself is just really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, but my, my main question is about ER beta and what you think maybe might be going on there. Um, so we definitely know less about ER beta. Um, I can tell you that like an ER beta knockout doesn't really have a big um, skeletal phenotype. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of that ER alpha versus ER beta, it, it doesn't really seem to play a huge role in bone. Um, but I can say that uh, BPA can bind to both ER alpha and ER beta. Um, so again, also kind of getting back to Dr. Parks's question, it could be really interesting to look at this in like alpha and beta knockouts and see which one maybe plays more of a role. Um, but I can tell you that um, ER beta knockouts don't usually have much of a skeletal phenotype. They just kind of are very similar to those normal wild type animals. Yeah, which parallels what we see in metabolism, metabolism as well. So excellent job, Becca. You did a really, really great job. Really interesting data. So thank, thank you. you. I have a question. <laughs> I haven't asked you very many questions about this because Franny's already asked all the questions but and conversations we've had. But um, have you come upon anything in the literature about reversing the effects of BPA? Because we're just all naturally exposed to BPA and bone health is really important in the population. So just wondering on your opinion on that. Um, I have not really looked into that and I don't really know. I mean, just because so many of us are exposed to BPA like so much, um, I don't necessarily know about reversing or like combating. I mean, that's definitely something that would be really cool to look into. Um, but I don't know if there's anything out there that's like, oh, if you decrease your exposure, then all of your skeletal outcomes get better. <laughs> um, I, I don't really have an answer to that. I, can I just add, there's this really cool study where they had people on a, I think it was 10 days of canned diet, canned soup, everything. And they switched them to 10 days freshly made foods that were exactly the same as what was in canned. And within 10 days, their BPA levels in their blood was zero. So oh, it wow. washes out pretty quickly. It mm -hmm. still may be stored in adipose, right, Vicki or, or Rebecca, but um, once you stop the, the exposure, it, it starts to fall away pretty quickly. Good to know. Yeah, and, and that's one of the limitations, at least to some of the BPA research, is a lot of them are using like urinary concentrations, and that really only tells you how much you've been exposed to in the past like 12 or 24 hours. Um, so we're still kind of trying to figure out the like long term storage kind of effect. But that is really cool that it clears if you um, do less canned food. Thank you. So Becca, there was a question in the chat about um, the difference between BPA and BPS. Can you um, talk about that a little bit more? Um, just kind of in general or oh, specifically sorry. related to, to the like in your results? Bone stuff. Um, so we didn't really see any effects of BPS, which was kind of interesting, but um, BPS seems to be a lot more, I don't know why I'm scrolling, um, BPS seems to be a lot more uh, tissue specific um, when it comes to differences. We're not the only ones to find um, that BPS has less of an impact than BPA. Um, I personally think it primarily um, kind of goes back to that binding curve that I showed you guys. It's just not as good at um, competing um, with estrogen signaling, but it's a definite possibility that there could be other things going on as well. Um, but it is kind of good to know. I didn't really say this, but um, particularly in, in places where they've banned BPA, um, you, see, you see a lot more BPS like in the industry and in exposure because a lot of places were just like, oh, well, we can't use BPA. We'll just use BPS or BP BPF instead and we can still claim it's BPA free. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's kind of a good indicator that maybe BPS might not be as problematic. Um, and, and my guess would just be, again, be kind of because of those issues with binding, um, but it's definitely worth looking into more. 
this this is kind of a new and kind of a small field so did that answer your question i hope so yes yeah, so sorry i'm reading a question in the chat somebody wants to know if coming from the dietetics aspect how do you think phytoestrogens found in plant foods affect bone health in men do you think they would be beneficial if so, do you think they might blunt some of the negative effects of BPA? So there's a lot in that question you might. Um, so yes, I do think that phytoestrogens are beneficial for men. Um, I didn't talk about that one, but I have done a study looking at soy protein um, and it seems to have some pretty positive effects on the bone, even in men. Um, and, but as far as whether or not that could counteract BPA specifically, um, I'm not sure. They both are competing. Um, they're both working through those estrogen receptors, um, but they're also both considered like weak estrogens. So as far as um, like genistein versus BPA binding capabilities, I don't know. And I don't know if BPA would actually, or soy protein would actually help counteract some of those effects. Like, hey, if you eat canned uh, soy protein, is that okay? Um, but I will say that yes, um, in general, soy is considered beneficial for bone in both men and women, um, particularly if you've eaten it for like a long time. Okay, just one last quest question in the chat and then we'll let you save some of your brain power for your committee. Um, what do you know about BPF and bone? Um, absolutely very little. Um, so BPF is kind of similar to BPS, um, where again, most people focused on BPA and it's more of a newer analog. Um, all I can really tell you is if you look up BPS or if you look up BPF in bone, you get like two studies and their cell culture models. Um, so we really don't know a lot about any of those analogs. Um, but I think um, BPF was more similar to BPS than BPA, um, but I would have to go back and double check. And again, a lot of this is kind of tissue specific. So you might see different effects in uterine or vascular tissue or the brain than you do in the bone. Great. Thank you, Becca. Can we all give Becca a round of applause for doing such a great job? <laughs> Thanks. And thank you everybody for um, coming. We really do appreciate you taking the time to hear what Becca's done. Um, for the committee members, we're going to leave this Zoom meeting and then get on the um, discussion Zoom meeting. And I'm gonna um, have the committee get on first and then let Becca know when we're ready for her. So thanks again, everybody. Take care. Thank you.